Okay, so remember, any differential equation in the form of this that has constant coefficients and is equal to zero has solutions in the form of e to the exponent alpha x. But remember, the most general form is a linear combination of all of the solutions y of x has, okay? So another thing I want you to recall is from the math lesson that I did, um, we talked about complex numbers. And I said that any complex number can be written um, in terms of its real part x and its imaginary part y. So it can be written as this. Um, an imaginary number is simply the square root of negative 1. So i is equal to the square root of negative 1. If I square both sides, then i squared turns out to be negative 1. Um, and i simply is the square root of negative 1. So another important point here was that if you square an imaginary number, you get a real number as a result. Now another thing I mentioned was Euler's formula, and that was e to the exponent positive negative i theta is just equal to cos theta plus negative plus minus i sine theta. So you can write complex numbers in two ways, um, and most people will actually work with Euler's formula. And remember, Euler's formula is the polar representation of a complex number, whereas the z form is the Cartesian representation of a complex number. And like I said, we'll actually be working with polar forms a lot more than Cartesian forms, okay? So moving on from that, let's go back um, to driving the classical wave equation. Um, and we're, we're at our last case, and that case is basically assume that k is a negative number. So if k is a negative number, I represent that mathematically by multiplying any positive number k squared with negative 1, okay? So I'm left with negative k squared here. So recall that our parent equation here is this term, and I'm going to go ahead and substitute k with negative beta squared this time, not k squared, but I'm just going to pick some arbitrary symbol beta squared just for the fun of it. Um, and I'm going to substitute x of x with its solution, e to the exponent alpha x. So if I do that, I did, I did the substitution, and now I'm just going to go ahead and do the derivative of e to the exponent alpha x two times, and then I'm going to try solving the equation for alpha. Okay, so I take the derivative once, I'm left with alpha, these two negative signs cancel out, and I'm left with a positive sign. Um, I do the derivative again, and I'm left with alpha squared e to the exponent alpha x here. These things are unchanged because there's no derivative going on. I divide this whole equation by e to the exponent alpha x, and I'm left with alpha squared plus beta squared is equal to zero. So that means alpha squared is equal to negative beta squared. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rewrite that a little bit differently. I'm going to rewrite that as negative 1 multiplied by beta squared. So I'm going to take the square root on both sides now. So if I take the square root on both sides, on the left-hand side, I'm left with alpha. And on the right-hand side, I'm left with positive negative square root of negative 1 multiplied by the square root of beta squared, okay? So remember, the square root of negative 1 is simply i, right, by definition. Um, and the square root of beta squared is beta. So alpha here is equal to positive negative i beta. So that leaves me with a solution for x of x in the form e to the exponent i beta x, um, because alpha here is equal to i beta and of course e to the exponent negative i beta x. So the general solution or the most general solution to x of x is a linear combination of both of these solutions and you can verify that on your own. Um, I've told you to verify it about two times and if you want you can do it the third time using this as well. So um, before I move on and I show you the linear combination, I want to mention that, you know, e to the exponent i beta x is comparable to e to the exponent i theta, where theta is equal to beta x. So, you know, these both look similar. Um, the only difference is instead of having theta, I have beta x. So beta x is just theta, okay? 
So I just want to mention that. Um, anyways, let's rewrite it in the most general form. And the most general form that x of x can be written as is a linear combination of both of its solutions or both of its roots or whatever you want to call them or its zeros. So x of x is equal to c1 e to the exponent i beta x plus c2 e to the exponent negative i beta x. So remember, I told you that when we're working with imaginary numbers, we don't really like working in Cartesian coordinates. We like working in polar coordinates. So I'm going to go ahead and use Euler's formula to convert this into its polar representation. Okay, so remember, Euler's formula is e to the exponent positive negative i theta, which is equal to cos theta positive negative i sine theta. Okay, so if there's a positive here, there's going to be a positive here. If there's a negative here, there's going to be a negative here. Okay? So, I'm going to rewrite um, this term and this term with this. So, if I rewrite this guy, I get cos beta x plus right because there's a positive here i sine beta x and beta x is kind of like our theta and then i'm going to get c2 um cos beta x minus now because there's a minus in front of this i um i sine beta x so i'm going to kind of rearrange that um by distributing the c's inwards um and i get um, I distribute the C and I distribute the C over here. I distribute this and I distribute that. And then I collect the like terms. So all the coses are together and all the sine terms are together. Okay? So remember, with the signs, because there's an I in front of the sign, the C is also multiplied by that I. So in this first term, C1 and C2 are kind of they go together because cos beta x is a factor so cos beta x gets factored out and I'm left with c1 plus c2 and similarly i c1 minus i c2 gets factored out and I'm left with sine beta x so um, since c1 and c2 are constants their sum is also a constant and same thing applies with i c1 minus i c2 um, so therefore um, i'm just going to call c1 plus c2 as a and i c1 minus i c2 as b so they're just going to be some numbers they're going to be some imaginary numbers or some real numbers but they're just going to be some numbers so i'm just going to call them a and b instead of you know re um, instead of writing out the whole i c1 c2 and so forth. Important thing to note here is that I replace c1 plus c2 with an a and i c1 minus i c2 with a b. So another thing to note is that both of these forms, the Cartesian form and the polar representation are equivalent and if you don't believe me you can go and you can substitute these into the parent equation and you'll get the same answer for both. Um, if you don't understand what I mean by going back and substituting it into the parent equation, leave it in the comment section and I'll do a video explaining it. Um, but I'm pretty sure most of you know what I mean. But if you don't know what I mean, leave a comment and I'll, I'll do it ASAP. Okay, now the important question is, is A cos beta x plus B sine beta x our answer? You know, the last two times we tried this method, I got a trivial solution. So is it right this time? Well, let's apply our boundary conditions and we'll find out. Okay, remember, our boundary condition is that at x is equal to um, 0 and x is equal to L, the x component of u is also equal to 0. Okay, so um, if I put 0 here and 0 here, right, then sine of 0 because beta times 0 is 0 so sine of 0 is also equal to 0 so this term disappears um, cos of 0 is actually equal to 1 you can do that on your calculator um, so that means a is equal to 0 here so it doesn't look too good right now but oh well we'll move on so we know that a is equal to 0 we don't know what b is yet so now let's put our second boundary condition, x is equal to um, L. When I do that, um, and I put it into my equation, well, I know that a is equal to 0, so this term disappears. So beta multiplied by sine beta L is equal to 0. Okay, so beta sine beta L is equal to 0. 
So that means either b is equal to 0. I'm sorry, that was b multiplied by sine beta l. I don't know why I said beta two times. But b multiplied by sine beta l is equal to 0. So that means either beta b is equal to 0 or sine beta l is equal to 0. Well, if b is equal to 0, that gives me another trivial solution. So I'm going to say that, okay, b is equal to 0 is mathematically okay, but it's not okay physically, so I'm going to reject that. So I'm going to say, well, b cannot be equal to 0 because if it was equal to 0, then that would give me a trivial solution. That means sine beta l here must be equal to 0. So if sine beta l is equal to 0, that means sine theta is equal to 0. Because remember, beta l is just equal to 0. Or I mean, beta l is just equal to theta. So sine theta is equal to 0. Um, but the only values of theta that give sine theta is equal to 0 are values such as 0, 180 degrees, 360 degrees, and so forth, or, or 0 pi radian, 2 pi radian, 3 pi radian, and so forth. So that means um, theta is equal to 0 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, so forth, or beta L, which is also theta, it's also equal to this. So I'm going to say that since, so generally what I can say is that beta L is just equal to n pi, where n can be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. I reject n is equal to 0 because if n was equal to 0, that would mean that again, sine is equal to 0, um, and that would give me a trivial solution. So I'm going to take all of the n values except for 0, okay? Because if I took 0, that would give me another trivial solution. So n cannot be 0, but n can be anything from 1 to positive infinity. So now that I know that beta L is equal to n pi, I can solve for beta. Okay, so remember beta was like our k. So instead of using k, I use this arbitrary symbol um, beta. So beta is equal to n pi over l. So finally, um, we can go back into our parent equation and I can substitute this value of beta into it. So remember, a is equal to 0, so this first term disappears. Um, that means x of x is equal to b sine, instead of beta, I'm going to put n pi over l, um, and then I have the x from here, okay? So x of x is just equal to b sine n pi x over l for all n greater than or equal to 1. So we finally solved this for x of x. Now we have to solve this for t of t, and we'll pick that up from the next video. I hope this helped. Um, if you have any questions, please leave it in the comment section.